Welcome to Modern Life is Goodish. My name is Dave Gorman. Now, I think you can tell what sort of a person you are by how you pronounce this word. Right? It's a movie about someone's life, but by show of hands, who here says biopic? And who here says biopic? Oh, it's a pretty 50-50 split there. That's an interesting kind of thing. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Um, I know, just because there's going to be audience shots, I've just, there's like a, there's a fancy dress sort of costume, it's just going to look really weird. I'm not, I don't want to pick on anyone, but I don't want to, can we move, because so, it's the girl in the front row, it's the third row, sorry, with the blue, red, yellow stripe thing. I'm not picking on you, it's just you've come in like cosplay. <laughs> sort of, it's like Star Wars. It's just going to, like any audience shot they go, people go, oh look, there's a Star Wars lady. Can you stand up? People think I'm being stupid. Can you just... Just... But look, it's a Star Wars outfit, isn't it? Look, obviously. You know... <laughs> well, you lot seem a bit confused by this. In which case, can someone explain this to me? For crying out loud... <laughs> Inspired by Star Wars... same outfit, and as you can see, it is apparently inspired by Star Wars. <laughs> this is on the website of the Westfield Shopping Centre, where it tells us that this spring-summer, Disney UK and Westfield have joined forces. That's nice, isn't it? May their forces be with one another. <laughs> for an innovative new Star Wars-inspired fashion campaign. Really? As you've all just proven with your reaction to my friend Rose here, <laughs> there is nothing remotely Star Warsy about that outfit, is there? I, admittedly, I have chopped one little bit out of the picture. I'm being slightly cheaty with you here. Um, that's the, the full picture. Um... <laughs> They've misunderstood the phrase inspired by there, haven't they? Was their use of the word inspired inspired by the word unrelated? <laughs> that's not inspired by Star Wars, is it? That's sitting next to something from Star Wars. <laughs> This isn't the only example on the Westfield website. These outfits are also apparently inspired by Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. Not animal prints, not nature, Star Wars. Which is apparently explained by this. <laughs> the weirdest and most intimidating chorus line you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> this is the subtle difference between inspired by Star Wars and won't clash with Star Wars. <laughs> which is not the same thing at all, is it? I mean, I suppose, for a lot of women, there's a lot to think about when you're choosing an outfit, isn't there? You know, is it slimming? How does my bum look in this? What happens if I run into Star Wars? These are, <laughs> these are the questions you've got to ask yourself, haven't you? This is apparently inspired by Star Wars. And actually, if you think about it, this one does make sense, doesn't it? Because that is very like the bra that Yoda on the outside of his outfit wore, isn't it? That <laughs> very much, isn't it? It really is very like it, really. <laughs> it, is. it is, isn't it? Yeah. Either that, or this is just another example of basically standing next to something from Star Wars. <laughs> there is actually a video as part of this ad campaign. Have a look at this. <laughs> yeah. I might as well say spring summer cheese, destination cheese, inspired by chalk for all the sense. <laughs> We all know these things weren't really inspired by Star Wars. If anything, they were inspired by the success of Star Wars. They've paid to be associated with something that is hugely successful. But that's not the same thing at all, is it? People love Star Wars so much, you can basically put Star Wars on almost anything and you will guarantee that you will sell more of it as a result. How else can you explain this? <laughs> Seriously, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because the army of the Dark Lord of Sith needs a sensitive gel. That, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. There are two of these. The blades aren't themed. The gel is just the normal gel. The only thing Star Warsy about this is the box it comes in. But nobody keeps the box their razor blade comes in, do they? You put your razor blade in a cup by the sink or what have you. And when you've done that, how is shaving giving you any kind of a Star Warsy vibe? Unless you're going, hmm. <laughs> work out how it is possible to be childish enough to fall for this and adult enough to need it. <laughs> Surely they've missed a trick, haven't they? These are the wrong characters, aren't they? Shouldn't it have been that fella? <laughs> That's how it should be on the box, shouldn't it? That makes more sense. 
That should be on the front of the box and that should be on the other side. <laughs> that makes much more sense. You've got to ask yourself, why do these exist? And I'll, I'll tell you why these exist. They exist so they can be a part of things like this. This is a write-up of an exclusive event celebrating the partnership between Gillette and Rogue One, a Star Wars story, that was held in honour of the new Star Wars-themed products from Gillette. Just take that in for a moment. An event has been held to honour... Yes, honour <laughs> these. <laughs> Has anyone here ever wanted to honour a shaving kit before now? <laughs> I doubt it. But someone from the website Movie Pilot has. One of their writers has gone to this event and you will never guess who was there. I can't believe it. He's so lucky. Someone that any movie buff would be delighted to see. Gillette Vice President John Mang. <laughs> oh. John Mang from Gillette? Oh, Vice President? Oh, I don't know. Do you think John Mang will ever be President of Gillette? I'm not sure. I think he's probably peaked at Vice President of Gillette. I, I think that's probably the best a man can get. I <laughs> yeah. But you know what? For our intrepid movie fan, this event was about to get better. He got to have a chat with John Mang. Yeah? Following the main stage events, I was given the opportunity to sit down with Mang for a one-on-one. One-on-one -on -one with John Mang? Mano a mango with Mang. <laughs> He must have had loads of questions for the Mangmeister, huh? Must have done, obviously. OK, he had one question, one question for the Mangmeister. <laughs> That's fair enough, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, the pressure must have been on. All these different journalists are getting their Mang time. You must be racking your brain to come up with a question that nobody else has come up with. I think our guy nails it. Why would Gillette choose to partner up with Star Wars? <laughs> yeah, well, I want to know that. Yeah, 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 John. What first attracted you to the billionaire movie franchise? <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, Mang had the perfect answer. He really did. Are you ready for his perfect answer? It's beautiful. Here we go. Everyone loves Star Wars, but what really drew us to it wasn't the franchise as a whole, but the story behind Rogue One. Star Wars has always been about the bigger picture, but Rogue One is just so much more personal, and we felt that really went with our brand. OK, razor blades, personal items. I think I can see what he's trying to do there. Goes on. This isn't the story of one guy saving the galaxy. This is a down-to-earth story. It's f***ing Star Wars! <laughs> Even I know that that happens in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> the one planet it is not down to is Earth. <laughs> this is a down-to-earth story. Am I alone in thinking that this makes no sense whatsoever? Or is our razor blade honouring scribe alone when he says, which makes an awful lot of sense? <laughs> It doesn't, does it? Not at all. Let's be, uh, that's not quite true. It makes a bit of sense. There is a tiny bit of sense in there. A semblance of sense has crept in. Let's whittle this answer down to where I think the truth lies. There you go. <laughs> everyone loves Star Wars. In so much as there is any one thing on Earth that everyone loves, I think Star Wars comes close. And surely that's all this really means. We paid a shit ton of money to Star Wars in order to sell more stuff to people who fall for that shizzle. Surely that's all this means. Nobody involved in this sort of thing wants to acknowledge that money is changing hands, which is why they use weasel words like inspired by. The word inspired is often misused, I find. Imagine you worked in the movie industry, right? And, and imagine your job was compiling soundtrack albums. That ought to be a really simple process. If it helps, I've come up with a flowchart that explains it, OK? Uh, you're thinking about a particular song. Ask yourself one question. Was the song in the movie, OK? There are two possible answers. You've got yes or you've got no. If it's yes, put it on the album, OK? That is literally what the soundtrack is supposed to be. If it's no, don't put it on the album. <laughs> that doesn't seem too complicated to me. That's not too much to ask, is it? Apparently, it's not the modern way. Now, the modern way is pretend it was inspired by the movie and chuck it on anyway. <laughs> Let me give you an example. Top Gun. Classic movie. Now, obviously, there was a soundtrack that came out at the same time as the movie. But then it was reissued in 1999 with additional songs, and then again in 2006 with yet more songs. Now, obviously, the songs that have been added are not from Top Gun. So it follows that they must be the songs that are inspired by Top Gun. So let's have a look at the track listings. Let's focus on the 2006 deluxe edition bonus tracks, which include, amongst others, the Power of Love, 
by Jennifer Rush. Oh, what a banger. Oh, yeah. Actually, that's not fair. I've never even met the woman. Don't know. But <laughs> let's look at the details for the song. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, it was released in 1984, which is odd, because Top Gun was released in 1986. <laughs> Of love, that's the power of time travel. <laughs> but we, we are going to go to a break now, but can we all agree on one thing? Nothing, and I mean nothing, has ever been inspired by the Smurfs 2. <laughs> I'll see you in a couple of minutes. Modern life is goodish. My name is Dave Gorman. I just thought I'd ask, what sort of a day has it been for you food-wise? You know, sir, do you mind, what, do you have a good lunch today? Yeah. What do you have? Coronation chicken. Coronation chicken. Sounds yeah. lovely. Yeah. I reckon, I'm guessing, but I think, I think my lunch was probably better than yours. Yeah. I had a really special lunch today. I made it myself. Lovely, it really was. I'll tell you what I did. You know, you get like a, a tin of chopped tomatoes, yeah? I had that. <laughs> Lovely, it really was. Absolutely gorgeous. Love it. Tin of tomatoes in a bowl with a spoon. Absolutely delicious. You can't, <laughs> can't fault it. It's gorgeous. It really was. If I've got any criticism of it at all, I'd say maybe a bit too tomato-y. <laughs> That'd be my, my one thing. Uh, you might think you know a better way of serving tin tomatoes, but, you know, I think the people who put those tomatoes in that tin probably know better than any of us, and that is how they suggest you serve them, isn't it? That, as you can see, that is the serving suggestion. It says it, right? <laughs> Clear as day, yeah? Ignore the Scandinavian abuse. That's not important. That is... <laughs> not important right now. But ignore that. Ignore that. The point is, this is how they suggest you serve their products. Actually, that's not all they suggest, is it? Their serving suggestion for their tin of chopped tomatoes is actually put it in a bowl next to some other tomatoes that have not been chopped. <laughs> we didn't have any tomatoes, so I used a couple of toy ones from my little lad's playset, and I... <laughs> I created the right ambiance. It's nice, isn't it? Yeah. I like the serving suggestions. You've got to trust the people who know the food better than anyone. I don't eat meat myself, but Mrs Gorman does, and I, I don't like to force my ways on others. I prepared a lovely meal for Mrs G just the other day. Oh, hot dog sausages. Even, even I am tempted. Straight from the tin, and exactly... <laughs> exactly as per the serving suggestion. <laughs> Stack them up, a couple of sprigs of non-specific green stuff. Job done. <laughs> Can't complain about that. Now, I'm not suggesting Mrs Gorman isn't grateful, but she did seem a little bit unhappy. It's like, oh, Dave, where are the vegetables? I'd been anticipating that. There you go, my darling. Uh, a lovely bowl of red kidney beans with a teaspoon. Yeah. Served exactly the way the manufacturer <laughs> suggests. Mmm, get your chops around that, absolutely, yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah, gorgeous. And would, would you like a little drink as well, my darling, I said? How about some coconut milk to go with it? Yeah. Oh, bit trickier, this one. Bit trickier, this one. <laughs> The serving suggestion seems to be, put it back in a coconut. <laughs> now, you might well question why someone with access to actual coconuts would need to buy tinned coconut milk. I'm not sure it's wise to question these things. If that's what they think is best, who am I to argue? Obviously, we, <laughs> we spilled a bit, but then that is precisely what they actually suggest, so fair enough. There are some serving suggestions that I'm pretty sure are actually impossible. Take Marks and Spencer's super sweet sweet corn, for example. This is the serving suggestion. Put it back on the cob. <laughs> you can't put it back on the cob. It's left the cob. Cob and niblet have parted company and never the twain shall meet. Unless you're Jennifer Rush with the power of time travel, what they are suggesting <laughs> is not physically possible, is it? And I know, because I've tried, and I promise you, once you've gone at it with a glue gun... <laughs> There's so much glue involved, you'd be hard-pushed <laughs> to eat more than half of that. You really would. That's, that's going to be a challenge for anyone at the best of times. God, what are they going to do next? Next, they're going to be suggesting we put peas back in their pod as well, aren't they? Well, yes, in fact, that's exactly what they're doing. <laughs> serving suggestion, put the peas back in their pods. <laughs> Obviously, serving suggestions are nonsense, but there is something to admire about food packaging. I like the way they list the ingredients in order. So on my delicious lunchtime tin of tomatoes, for example, you get a, a rundown of the ingredients, and as you can see, it's 65% tomatoes and 34.9% tomato juice, and that leaves just 0.1%, which must be the citric acid. 
Huh? I like the fact that you know the first ingredient is the biggest. It's, it's true for all foods. I assume that's the law. And that seems to me to be right and proper. One day, when I'm in charge, it will also be the law for movies. <laughs> they will have to list the actors in order of how many minutes of screen time they get. I think most of us assume that is the case with films, because most of the time it actually is the case. For example, here are two posters that very adequately describe exactly what is the largest ingredient in their respective films. But sometimes the poster will lie to you. Okay? For example, here is a, a little-known British film from 2007 called 12 in a Box. Now, on first impressions, this looks like a, a vegetable soup of a film. Lots of ingredients, all in similar quantities. You've got your, your Kenneth Collard, you've got your Brian Mitchell, your Lucy Chalkley, your Phoebe Sweeney and your Jane McDowell there. But this is how they marketed the film when it was first released in 2007. It got a re-release in 2013 and they decided that one of the cast had earned a slightly bigger billing. Oh, but who could it be? Drum roll, please, ladies and gentlemen. That's right, Miranda Hart. <laughs> Six years after they first made this film, it appears to have had a heart transplant. I don't care. I don't care what the law says. Anyone looking at that image has every right to assume that it stars Miranda Hart, when in reality she's on screen for about five minutes. Pretending she's the star of the film when she's only in it for five minutes would be like me telling you that tonight's show stars Frank Skinner just because he's got one line in the show. Isn't that right, Frank? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> And if you don't believe me that Miranda's part is that small, here's a review of the film that refers to Miranda's short and sweet cameo. That does not suggest a cameo appearance, does it? These don't even look like they could be the same film. This is like relabeling your tin of tomatoes as citric acid because it's gone on to have its own sitcom. <laughs> look, we're going to have a little break now. I'll see you in a couple of minutes. To modern life is goodish, ladies and gentlemen, where, amongst other things, we've been talking about honesty in movie marketing. Now, when the makers of a smash flop like 12 in a Box do this, I can sort of understand. I mean, they've invested money in a film. They've almost certainly lost quite a lot of money. I certainly find it hard to believe that they've made any significant amount of money. And it's there, sitting on the shelf, gathering dust, and then suddenly they can see an opportunity. One of their bit part players has become a bona fide star and so, with a new poster, they see a chance to squeeze a few quid out of some gullible punters. And they've got nothing to lose, have they? I mean, even if they do make another film one day, it's not going to have from the makers of 12 in a box on the poster, is it? There is no highly anticipated 13 in a box or, <laughs> or 12 in two boxes <laughs> that can be damaged by this mendacity. They don't care if people feel conned because they've already got your money. I'm not saying I approve, but I understand. But then there are times when I don't understand, like, like this, for example. The Lady in the Van. This is a brilliant film, an Alan Bennett film, a high-quality, successful film that has grossed more than $40 million. Now, according to this artwork, if this was a stew, Maggie Smith would be the main ingredient, right? She's your beef. Ah, that's fair enough, isn't it? But Alex Jennings and James Corden, they're your potatoes, aren't they? Between them, they're bulking this out. And then you've got Roger Allen and Francis de la Tour, who are your peas, carrots and swede and what have you, OK? I think that's, that's the grammar that we all understand. But is James Corden really as much a part of this film as Alex Jennings? Which is what this artwork suggests to me. How much James Corden is there in this film? I'll tell you what, let's have a look at the trailer for this film, OK? I'm going to put it on fast forward, we're going to whiz through it. Let's all play a game of spot the cordon, OK? Let's whiz through the trail. Here we go, that's Alex Jennings and Maggie Smith, Alex Jennings and Maggie Smith, and Alex Jennings there, and Alex Jennings and Maggie Smith, and Maggie Smith and Jennings and Smith there, Alex Jennings Smith, there, 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 going for, and... Ooh, ah! <laughs> I got him! I got it, yes, there he is. Now, I know some of you thought he wasn't going to appear, thought that was the game I was playing, but he is in the film, there he is. Uh, you had me wrong. Let's just rewind and then hit play so we can see his appearance in the trailer properly. Especially lovely today, sweetheart. Don't sweetheart me. I'm dying, possibly. Chin up, love, we all got to go sometime. <laughs> Smells like you already have. <laughs> A nice, cheeky little performance, isn't it? Absolutely. Rounds the trail off nicely. That is lovely. 
But let's have a look at all of James Corden's appearances in the film. Let's count his lines as we go, OK? Now, the first scene is actually the one we've just sort of seen in the trail. So while I know it's there, and I know that you know it's there, for the sake of completeness, let's just take another quick look. You all right, my love? Looking especially lovely today, sweetheart. Don't sweetheart me. I'm a sick woman. Dying, possibly. <laughs> All right, well, chin up, love. We all got to go sometime. Smells like you already have. <laughs> Lovely. Two lines in that scene, perfectly delivered. So what have we got next? Nothing! <laughs> He's not in any more scenes. That's literally it. He has two lines in the film, both of which are in the trail. He's not the potato in the stew. He's not even the salt. There is a homeopathic quantity of James Corden in this film. <laughs> and yet they've given him third billing on the cover. This is produced by the BBC. It's an Alan Bennett film. I know he's not responsible for the cover of the DVD, but surely he looks at it and thinks, oh, dear, me films lied to people. <laughs> I just think things should be sold honestly. There are other ways in which you can feel misled by a movie. I'll give you another example. OK, Mrs Gorman and I went to see a film a while back. As it goes, I loved it. I turned to Mrs Gorman at the end of the film, expecting to see her in the same happy place as me, but she was puce with rage. She hated this film. She hated this film because she couldn't get past the fact that she felt like she'd been lied to. The film was called Joy. Now, fair enough, it is a Jennifer Lawrence film. The poster is honest about that much. But it doesn't tell you enough about the subject matter of the film, OK? Let's have a look at the trailer. Now, it starts with an elderly woman a grandmother passing on advice and wisdom to her young granddaughter. Listen to me. I'll tell you what's going to come of you. So what is going to become of her? Let's find out. You are going to grow up and be a strong, smart young woman. And that's great. What grandmother wouldn't wish that future for her granddaughter? Go to school. Meet a fine young man. Have beautiful children of your own. And you're going to build wonderful things. And that is what is going to happen to you. So I know that not every young girl has to aspire to finding a man and having children, but I think we all know that it's still what most grandmothers want for their granddaughters, isn't it? It's the American dream. But the music has started, and it's setting the tone, and it's giving us a clue that all is not quite right. And it's about to send us two very distinct musical messages. One, it's a Christmas film. <laughs> And two... <laughs> ..that you can't always get what you want. Now, we all know this music. We know how the lyrics flow. And so we know that we're going to go through a couple more rounds of not always getting what she wants, aren't we? And as you can see, yeah, there's a love interest and there's, there's going to be a, a, a funeral. We can see that. We can, we can see there are children and we can see there's a wedding. We can see Robert De Niro and we can see tears and domestic drudgery. These things are not going well, but because we know where the song is going, we know that it's got to get better. We know that if you try sometimes, you find you get what you need. <laughs> Look at her there with a the light behind her. She's risen like Christ. She's going to try. She's going to get what she needs. And here comes the motivational speech. Don't ever think that the world owes you anything, because it doesn't. Yeah, quite right. Jennifer Lawrence isn't going to put up with this anymore. She's not going to settle. She's going to bloody well go out there and make the world give her what she needs. And now the music starts to change and we go up a gear. Oh, yeah. Look at that. She's in a jungle. She's, she's in an office. She's got a sledgehammer. She's got a haircut. She's winding rope. He's winding something. It's Bradley. They're happy. There's snow. There's origami. There's the wedding. She's being taken away. She's being arrested. She's put in jail. What the hell's going on? Who are they? What is going on here? <laughs> I don't know, but I want to see it. And we can still go up another gear. Oh, look at that. She's delivering coffee like a demon. No, De Niro's dancing. She was dancing. Cooper's excited. Everyone's pumped up. People are applauding. She's in a factory. There's a cowboy that's shaking hands. Her children again. She's in... She's got a gun! <laughs> this is amazing. There is one more gunshot, and then the crowning line of the trailer. My name's Joy, by the way. Yeah. That is powerful stuff. That made me want to see the film. That made Mrs Gorman want to see that film. And when she saw it, oh, she hated that film. Because the trail did not adequately explain what that film was about. You see, this film is a biopic. 
It's a biographical picture about the life of someone called Joy Mangano. Joy Mangano is not, as you might expect, John Mang's secret drag name. No, no. <laughs> Joy Mangano is an inventor. And the main thing she invented is the self-ringing miracle mop. <laughs> Joy is a film about a woman who invents a mop. <laughs> it's about a woman who is born into poverty, who lives a life of drudgery and then turns her life around by inventing a mop. I promise you, that is all it's about. It's literally the moppiest film you are ever going to see. <laughs> But if you don't believe me, here's the entry on the Internet Movie Database, here's the cast list, and right down there is a mop executive, right? <laughs> I wouldn't be at all surprised to hear that Robert De Niro only appeared in this film because he got the wrong end of the stick and thought he was going to play a mob boss. <laughs> and I know what some of you are thinking. You think I'm exaggerating just how moppy this film is. I am not. It is about a bloody mop. She invents a mop. She sells a mop. It's not working out for her, but she gets a deal with QVC. Nobody else can sell the mop properly, so she persuades them to put her on screen, and so she starts selling millions of mops, but then she discovers somewhere in the supply chain... Yeah, there's a supply chain. <laughs> people are ripping her off, and that could ruin her, but by now she knows that nobody is getting in the way of her and her mop, and so she goes all badass and sorts it out, and now she's rich and she's a mop lady, because that's what this film is about. <laughs> And if you don't want to take my word for it, let's have a look at some of the user reviews on IMDb where people are reviewing it and then one of them saying, oh, some will find a story about the manufacture of a mop doll. <laughs> or how about the bottom line is that this is a feature film about the creator of a better mop. <laughs> Still not convinced. I don't think I'm giving much away by saying the movie asked its audience to hinge their emotional cash on a mop. <laughs> the word mop is about every fifth word in this film, and yet it doesn't get a mention in any of the marketing. And Mrs Gorman could not shake the idea that she'd been lied to. And do you know what? I genuinely love the film. And if you'd told me it was about a mop, I still would have bought a ticket, because I find the idea of a film about a mop inventor appealing. But if Mrs Gorman had known, she bloody well wouldn't have bought a ticket, and that would have been better all round, because then we wouldn't have had to pay for a babysitter. <laughs> Jennifer Lawrence, you owe me. <laughs> Now, it is only fair that I point out there are clues to the mop-based content in the trailer, OK? This is a scene from the trailer. This was there, let's be fair. And it's hard to see, but that is her holding the mop, OK? It is. That is her holding a real mop. That's, that's real, it's not squeegee eye. That is an actual mop <laughs> that she's holding. All these scenes are in the trailer too. Huh? Top left, that's her taking inspiration from the hair of a doll. Top right, that's her drawing the first prototype of her mop. Bottom left, that's her winding some strings for a mop. And finally, bottom right, she's in a mop factory. I can see that those are all elements of the trail, and I can see those are all about a mop. But do you know why I know they're all about a mop? Because I've already seen the film! <laughs> this is Jaws, right? That's about a shark. <laughs> Poster. You know it's about a shark, don't you? Nobody could buy a ticket for Jaws without knowing what they were letting themselves in for, could they? The sharky nature of the film is not in doubt. If they'd called that film Martin... <laughs> ..you'd have had every reason to feel cheated. Jaws is about a shark, Joy is about a mop. So tell us it's about a mop, for crying out loud. You know what? The correct pronunciation of this word, in this instance, it's by Mopic. <laughs> no. As you know, I think things should be sold honestly. So I have taken the liberty of making what I think is a more honest trailer for Joy. Would you like to try a new mop? Well, it's the only mop you'll ever have to buy. It's the mop of the future. There's a clip that connects the sleeve to the, the cup. So when you pull up on the sleeve, the mop head stretches so you can ring it without ever touching it. I hate having to touch the mop head after I get done cleaning the bathroom floor. Self-ringing mop. A mop head. The mop head. Mop head. Setting new mop. Brand new mop. Disgusting mop head. Mop. 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 I take this mop head. Mops. Mops. Mop. There's not another mop on the market that has as much removable mop head. Mop. Mop. It's lightweight. It's the only mop that you're ever going to buy. The best mop you're ever going to use. Mop. A single mop. I'll see you after the break. Ladies and gentlemen, now, as we saw earlier, 
I don't think it's right when a small cameo appearance is made out to be something much bigger than it is. But sometimes, people get upset with a cameo by a big star for no reason other than it exists. As an example, ladies and gentlemen, may I present Ed Sheeran in Game of Thrones? A young man at the top of his game. Why shouldn't he have a bit of fun? He was excited about it, as you can see here. There he is. Yeah. Yeah. Ed Sheeran spills the beans, which actually, incidentally, is how Asda suggests you serve them, so... <laughs> Quite right, but no. he spills the beans on his Game of Thrones role. I don't think he could possibly have anticipated the anger his short cameo would go on to generate. So much abuse that, according to the Telegraph, it drove him off Twitter. Oh, poor old Ed Sheeran. According to The Guardian, his cameo was dire, uh, while the Metro just wanted to know why he was there in the first place. I genuinely don't know quite how he merits so much abuse. He seems like quite a nice chap, after all. But I had to look as far as Miami to find a headline that accurately summed up my feelings on this issue. Now, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, when the top half of the internet is acting like this, you can only imagine what was steaming <laughs> around the bottom half. I've read every single comment I could find on this story. I do it so that you don't have to. I've, I've taken those comments and turned them into something that I think is more beautiful, something that I like to call a found poem. That I would like to perform for you now. Ed Sheeran is not an actor, and Game of Thrones is not top of the pops. So please get that drippy strummer off my TV now. <laughs> drippy strummer. Nice one. <laughs> he can strum me drippy anytime. <laughs> People need to understand that their opinion on this issue is just not wanted. And I include me in that. <laughs> so, seeing as my opinion is as worthless as yours, let me give it to you straight. <laughs> Shirios and Thronies are two of the best fandoms. And two of the best fandoms should unite, not fight. Shirio Thronies forever. <laughs> I hate celeb cameos in films. Rain Man should have been a brilliant film because Dustin Hoffman is a brilliant actor. But they ruined it by giving Tom Cruise a really big cameo. <laughs> Putting Ed Sheeran in Game of Thrones just because you like Ed Sheeran is like Man United picking Greg Wallace as a centre forward <laughs> just because they quite like MasterChef. <laughs> I quite like MasterChef, but I'm not asking Greg Wallace to tarmac my drive. <laughs> Singers sing, actors act, tarmacers tarmac, <laughs> and Greg Wallace is a greengrocer. <laughs> End of. Ed Sheeran, lucky busker. <laughs> the Game of Thrones is nothing more than pornography. Some of the so-called actresses even have a history as porn stars. That is not exactly something to be proud of. Yes, it is. <laughs> When I was at school, there was a boy who looked like Ed Sheeran. We didn't know it at the time, because Ed Sheeran wasn't famous yet. <laughs> anyway, when Ed first became famous, I wondered if it was actually him. And then I remembered that his name was Peter. <laughs> so it isn't him. <laughs> I bet Peter hasn't been in Game of Thrones. <laughs> Lol. <laughs> Haters gonna hate, but whatever they think, one thing's for certain. Ed Sheeran is class. <laughs> ask you a question, ladies and gentlemen. What are these things? What have they got in common? I'll tell you what these things have got in common. They are all trying to part you from your cash, and to some degree at least, they are claiming a connection with fame that is not really theirs to claim in order to achieve that goal. But why does that work? Is it wrong to blame them for doing it, or is it our fault for falling for it? Are we, as a society, so enthralled to celebrity that this kind of behaviour is inevitable? 
Well, there's only one way of finding out, ladies and gentlemen. I sent Annabel Port, a very good friend of the show, out onto the streets of London to ask members of the public one simple question. Now, the question is in two parts. I'll talk you through it so we can all be really clear about exactly what was being asked of people. The first part of the question is as follows. We're doing some market research for an anti-snoring product that doesn't work. OK, now, obviously we weren't. There is no real anti-snoring product. She's just pretending that we're doing market research for one, OK? And then the second part of the question is as follows. What celebrity, if they were endorsing it, would you buy it from? <laughs> I think the key information here is, does not work, would you buy it? <laughs> and there's only one correct answer to that, isn't there? If you're a rational human being, the correct answer is clearly no. I wouldn't buy it. There is no celebrity who could sell it to me. It does not work. And I can tell some of you are thinking, well, you're playing games here, aren't you, Dave? I bet you've asked the question in a way that doesn't make that point entirely clear. You are wrong. Let me show you exactly how Annabelle asks this question. We're doing some market research. Some market research. Market research. An anti-snoring product. Anti-snoring product, which unfortunately doesn't actually work. It doesn't work at all. Clinical trials. Clinical trials. Clinical trials are proving it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. It doesn't work at all. It's completely ineffective. Completely ineffective. It doesn't work at all in any way. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work, no. <laughs> there is absolutely no doubt that they all know it doesn't work. And then we get the second part of the question as follows. And we we're just wondering, what celebrity? What celebrity? Is there a celebrity? What celebrity? What celebrity, if they were endorsing it, if they were endorsing it, you would buy it from? Buy it from? Could persuade you to buy it, buy it, buy it, buy it, buy it, bearing in mind that it doesn't work. <laughs> was there for a couple of hours, right? She got 29 people to stop. Only five of them had the correct answer. That is amazing. We really thought it was going to be the other way around. I thought this was a fishing expedition. Go out, talk to 20 people, see if you can find two or three people who've got an answer for us. Find those gems. It went completely the other way. These are the five people who said no. The correct way to answer this question. It's very easily done. It isn't a trick question, as this woman shows. Is there a celebrity who, if they were endorsing it, you would buy it from? No. Very easily done, isn't it? Yeah. And Annabelle doesn't give up. She doesn't take no for an answer easily. She does her normal trick, which is staying with the microphone at arm's length so it's still your turn and saying nothing in the hope that you give in and feel like you've got to provide an answer. No. No. <laughs> yeah. That woman is not for turning. She knows her mind and good on her. It's easily done. But only five people could pull a no out of their arse. Everyone else was like this. Is there a celebrity who, if they were endorsing it, that you would buy it from, even though it doesn't work? Yes, there is. <laughs> what the hell is going on there? Yes, there is. Not just that, he knows which celebrity. Danny DeVito. Straight off the top of his head. And he's got his logic all worked out, OK? Listen to this. Because I imagine he might snore. <laughs> now, maybe, maybe you're thinking he's not taking in the fact that it doesn't work. Don't worry, Annabelle is scrupulously fair. Even though it doesn't work, though. That could not be clearer. Um... What do you mean? <laughs> all right. Maybe it could be clearer. <laughs> The anti-snoring device doesn't work, unfortunately. But if he was advertising it, you wouldn't know that, right? When I watched this through the first time, I was thinking, OK, he's passing this question differently. He thinks the question is more, you know it doesn't work, but you're not the customer. Help us out here. We know it doesn't work, you know it doesn't work, but who could we get to persuade some other idiots to buy it? OK, I thought he's just, he's just gladly giving up his time to help us con other people out of money. <laughs> <laughs> But I was wrong. That is not what is going on. Like I say, Annabelle, always very clear. Uh, I think we would have to put it on the advertising. All right. So he knows it doesn't work, and he knows the advertising will have to say that it doesn't work. <laughs> it oh, work. Uh, I'd still buy it from him. <laughs> what? How does that work? A seemingly sane person he would still buy it knowing it did not fulfil its only purpose in life. <laughs> That's like buying a tent made out of air. <laughs> now, 
And by the way, he is not an outlier. I haven't just plucked our one golden example out. There were loads like this. An anti-snoring device. Yeah, it doesn't work at all. Kevin Hart, definitely. But I wouldn't know it didn't work. No, you know, I've told you. Cheryl <laughs> Cole, Benny Emery. Bearing in mind the product doesn't work. Oh. Uh, yeah, Kevin Hart, he'll make it work somehow. <laughs> yeah. Even though it doesn't work. Yeah, Lenny Emery. It doesn't work. Can't do nothing about it, innit? But you'd still buy it from Cheryl Cole. Yeah. <laughs> What is going on? Incidentally, the, the guy who said Lenny Henry, we asked him why, and he went, oh, well, he's already doing those bed adverts. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even shown you my favourite person yet. I am slightly in love with this person. I, I find this genuinely amazing. I would love to live in a world of such certainty. To always know my mind, to know exactly what I think about everything. It's this lady, she is my favourite. Put yourself in her position, OK? We've been talking about this question for a little while now. Our brains have circled it three times and set up camp. Try to imagine you're hearing the question for the very first time. Okay? We're doing some market research for an anti-snoring product that doesn't work. Where is your brain at that moment in time? Is there anything popping into your mind at that point? I think my mind would be getting blanker. If someone had stopped me on the street and asked me that, I'd be thinking, oh, I'm, I'm out of my depth. I wasn't expecting that. Not this woman. She knows exactly what she thinks. So we're doing some market research on an anti-snoring product, which unfortunately doesn't work at all. Brilliant. Is there a celebrity? <laughs> brilliant. Yeah. It's not, is it? It's not brilliant. No one should think that in response to that question. <laughs> It's not just at the halfway stage that she knows her mind. Annabelle has barely finished the question when she comes up with an answer. Is there a celebrity who, mm. if they were endorsing it, you would buy it? Brian Blessed. <laughs> <laughs> I love this woman so much. Brian Blessed. Brian Blessed. <laughs> That's my new ringtone. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, she's, she's worked it out. Brian Blessed. I imagine he really snores. Yeah. She's lodged it out. She imagines he snores. And you know what? He probably does. Although, I'm not sure snoring is really enough for Brian Blessed. I reckon Brian Blessed wakes up every 20 minutes and goes, SNORE! <laughs> 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 Makes more sense. <laughs> <laughs> and even though it doesn't work, you would still buy it from... Probably if Brian Blessed said so, yeah. <laughs> Probably if Brian Blessed said so. <laughs> now, I started tonight's show by saying there are two sorts of people, and there really are, but it's five out of 29. Those are not good odds for the five. <laughs> Let me show you what that really means. In this pie chart, let's imagine that green represents rational thought and blue, irrational thought. And let's see what five out of 29 looks like. It's hard to fight the idea that the sea levels of idiocy are rising soon <laughs> to consume us all. It turns out, ladies and gentlemen, that we are to blame. We are lied to daily because we're bloody idiots. No wonder people tell us their dresses are inspired by... Sorry, someone's got a phone on. I'm trying to do the serious bit and we've got a... Brian Blessed. Brian Blessed. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. Brian Blessed. Brian Blessed. <laughs> I can't. Brian Blessed. Brian Blessed. I can't. Brian Blessed. It's not. Brilliant. Brian Blessed. I can't. Sorry. Brian Blessed. It's not reading Brian my Blessed. thumbprint. I'm not. Brian Blessed. I... Sorry. That was the wrong number, I think, anyway. <laughs> anyway, the moment's gone now. Thanks for watching. Good night. Yeah.